Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for braving the bad weather to come to this lecture, which is the fourth in a series on post-war politicians who have made the weather that has set the political agenda, even though none of them became Prime Minister. And the first three lectures were on an Iron Bevan, who was founder of the National Health Service, Ian MacLeod, the uh, apostle of rapid decolonization in Africa, and Roy Jenkins, the pioneer of liberal legislation on personal liberties and race relations in the 1960s, and the apostle also of party realignment. And today's lecture, the fourth, is on Enoch Powell. And he pronounced his surname, incidentally, Powell and not Pole, as people sometimes do. Now, Enoch Powell was a very popular politician, and there's a possibility that if we'd had a presidential system of direct election, that he might have become leader of the country, though I think the probability is not. But there's a possibility he would have been. But unlike the first three people I've talked about, Bevan, MacLeod and Jenkins, he had no major legislative achievements to his credit. And part of the reason for that, he was in government only for a very short time, a much shorter time than perhaps most people imagine. He was a member of the cabinet for just 15 months and he held junior posts in government for a further four years. So he wasn't a man of government or of any legislative achievement. And one reason for his short period in government is that he was a very difficult colleague who didn't hide his dislike and indeed contempt for at least two of the Conservative Party leaders whom he served under, Harold Macmillan and Edward Heath. His antipathy to Edward Heath is notorious, but he was also very hostile to Harold Macmillan. And uh, if I can tell a personal anecdote, uh, I met Enoch Powell as a student, uh, and I was shocked by, by his very direct manner when he said of Harold Macmillan, I couldn't stand the sight of him. But he then added with a smile, I'm sure he felt the same way about me. <laughs> And uh, I think he did. Uh, Macmillan put him at the side of the cabinet table, and he was sitting in the chair in the middle, and Powell was at the side of the cabinet table. Macmillan said so he didn't have to look at those staring, obsessive, fanatical eyes. He said he didn't lie. Incidentally, that is also the position in which Edward Heath put Margaret Thatcher when he was <laughs> Prime Minister. Now, Harold Macmillan was a difficult colleague. In 1958, he resigned from Harold Macmillan's government and was brought back in 1960. In 1963, he refused to serve Harold Macmillan's successor, Sir Alec Douglas Hume. He was brought back to the shadow cabinet by Alec Hume after the Conservative defeat in 1964, and he was retained there by Edward Heath, Hume's successor. But in 1968, for reasons that I will describe later, he was sacked from the shadow cabinet by Edward Heath. And he was never in the cabinet or shadow cabinet again. But his period in the political wilderness coincided with his great popularity in the country. He was widely distrusted by his colleagues, but greatly admired by the general public. So Powell's significance came not from what he achieved in Parliament or in government, but what he stood for, or what he taught, if you like. He was, for better or worse, a teacher rather than a legislator, like my next two subjects, Tony Benn and Keith Joseph, none of whom are particularly distinguished for legislative achievements, but who made a great impact on public opinion. And Powell himself said that was the job of the politician. He said the task of the politician is to provide people with words and ideas which will fit their predicament better than the words and ideas they are using at the present. And uh, I think Powell altered, for better or worse, the nature of political discussion on four issues. They are firstly the role of the free market, secondly immigration, thirdly the European Union, and fourthly, the dangers of Scottish devolution, which he said would lead to separation. 
Now, uh, I'm sure you will all have noticed that these issues are at the very forefront of current political debate, particularly the last three, immigration, the European Union and Scottish independence. So whether you agree or not with Enoch Powell's views, it would be difficult to deny his contemporary relevance. And some would say that he was prescient, that he predicted with uncanny accuracy the future problems of British politics. Others would say that he aroused irrational fears and appealed to the worst instincts of voters. And that, of course, is for you to decide. But my task in this talk is to outline his career as fairly as I can. Now, Enoch Powell, or Jack Enoch Powell, as he was actually christened, was born in Birmingham, uh, oddly enough, in Stetchford, which was Roy Jenkins' constituency, though he had nothing in common with Roy Jenkins. They're polar opposites, I think, politically. He was born in June 1912, and perhaps symbolically, a violent thunderstorm accompanied his birth. He was an only child, and both of his parents were teachers. Uh, his father became headmaster of an elementary school, but his mother had to give up her position upon marriage, as was the rule in those days. But she compensated by teaching her son, who was to be her star pupil. She taught him the alphabet at the age of three, and he picked it up very quickly and was already reading books then. And he had the habit, even at the age of three, of lecturing other people on subjects that interested him, and as early as the age of three, he was nicknamed the Professor. <laughs> His natural conservatism with a small c came out very early in life. As a young boy, he was taken by his parents to Carnarvon Castle. And on entering one of the rooms in the castle, he removed his cap. And when asked why, he said, because it was in that room that the Prince of Wales had been born. Now, Powell's mother had taught herself Greek from the New Testament, and when Powell was 12, she taught him Greek, and he proved an outstanding scholar at school in the classics. He was single-minded and won all the classics prizes, and said that he would become an academic in classics. But he found to his horror, when working on the Greek historian Thucydides, that one of the commentators on him was called John U. Powell. And he said, you can't have two great Greek scholars called John Powell. So from then on, he began to call himself J. Enoch Powell, and then simply Enoch Powell. That's how he became Enoch Powell. In December 1929, he went up to, take, to Cambridge to take the scholarship exam in classics at Trinity College, Cambridge. The examinations lasted three hours, but Powell walked out of every one after one and a half hours. And he later said that in his Greek prose composition, he had given two versions, one in the style of Thucydides and one in the style of Herodotus. <laughs> the examiners wrote to his headmaster that in the translation paper, he had offered two translations, one in the style of Plato and one in the style of Herodotus. In addition, they said Powell had annotated the translations. Not surprisingly, he won the scholarship. At Cambridge, he did nothing but work. He played no part whatever in politics or indeed in anything else. And later in life, he said of himself, I saw my life when I went to Cambridge, far too much, I realise in retrospect, as a simple continuation of the prize, scholarship-winning, knowledge-eating process of the working side of my school life. I literally worked from half-past five in the morning until half-past nine at night, behind a sported oak, except when I went out to lectures. That was not because I disliked my fellows. It was that I didn't know there was anything else to do. When a school friend called on him to ask him out for tea, Powell replied, thank you very much, but I came here to work. He declined an invitation from the master of the college, the only example in living memory. He declined an invitation from the master of the college to the freshman's dinner, giving as his reason pressure of work. As an undergraduate, 
he contributed an article to a learned journal in Greek history. Not surprisingly, he won all the Classics Prizes, achieved a double first, and was offered a fellowship by his college. But he was more ambitious than that. He wanted to become the youngest professor in the Commonwealth. And he succeeded in 1937. He became professor of Classics at the University of Sydney in Australia at the age of 25. Then, two years later, in 1939, he was appointed Professor of Greek and Classical Literature at Durham. And that was a post to be taken up in January 1940. But before that, the war intervened and Powell joined the army. But not before he'd published a lexicon of Herodotus. And that is a book detailing every word used by Herodotus and its origins. And he said... He hoped that book would secure him immortality because anyone studying Greek would have to read it. And it would preserve his name even if, as he expected, he was to be killed in the war. Because he said he had no hesitation in joining up, but he remembered the First World War when the average period of survival in the trenches was about six weeks and he thought he probably would not survive and that he had therefore determined there should be some memorial to his name. Uh, incidentally, a, a recent uh, novel of alternative history has been published by a man called C.J. Sansom called Dominion. And it's about what Britain would have been like in 1952 uh, if we'd made peace with Germany in 1940. And there's a kind of quizzling government at that time, headed by Lord Beaverbrook, in which Powell is the Secretary of State for India. Now, I think whatever you think of Enoch Powell, that seems to me very unfair, that he had no sympathy at all with Nazi Germany. Indeed, he helped some Jewish academics in classics from Germany to leave the country, and he says he realised from a very early stage that there would be a war with Germany and that he would have to fight in it, and he actually welcomed the coming of war. I mean, this novel by Sansom Dominion is actually quite a good novel, but unfair to Powell, I think. And... Um, as well as his lexicon of Herodotus before the war, he wrote volumes of poetry which he published, including a poem describing his own feelings when war broke out, feelings which were, to say the least, rather unusual. He said, I wrote a poem in which I described people joining up at the outbreak of a war like bridegrooms going to meet their bride. That's how joining up was for me. The thing expected for so many years, the thing which one feared wouldn't happen, but would instead be replaced by disgrace and humiliation, it had happened. The chance had come at last. As I once described it, I felt I could hear the German divisions marching across Europe, and I could hear the drumming coming through the earth and coming up again in Australia, where no one else could hear it. And he loved the army. He said later, I took to the army like a duck to water. It seemed to me such a congenial environment. The whole institution of the army, the framework of discipline, the exactitude of rank, the precision of duty, this was something almost restful and attractive to me, and I took great pride in smartness at drill. There are always, I suppose, some absurd compliments one remembers. One that I shall remember all my days was my platoon sergeant saying to the company commander that I was the smartest soldier in the company. He said, I take that as a very, very great compliment. He once said later in life, whether sincerely or not, that his great regret was not to have been killed in the war like many of his friends. Whether that was sincere or not, we don't know. But what we do know was that he was as successful in the army as he'd been in academic life. He entered the army as a private and ended as a brigadier, one of the youngest brigadiers in the army. But during the war, something uh, very important happened to him, that he was working in the intelligence section of the Indian army, and he says he fell in love with India. He said, I fell head over heels in love with it. He said, if I'd have gone there a hundred years earlier, I'd have left my bones there. He learnt Urdu 
to familiarize himself with Indian civilization and was later to talk to his Indian-born constituents in Urdu in Wolverhampton, which couldn't have been very usual. And India uh, aroused his political interests. The importance of India to Britain, preserving the empire, and he's described this in fairly laconic terms. He said, one day, when the monsoon broke in Delhi, in June 1944, I suddenly said to myself, you're going to survive. There'll be a time when you won't be in uniform. Painful though it may be, you've got to face it. There'll be a lifetime for you, and a lifetime not as a soldier. This was the opening of the door from one mental room to another. And there was the answer, of course, you'll go into politics in England. And he went into politics to preserve the Indian Empire. So you won't be surprised to know that he joined the Conservative Party. And he obtained a post in the Conservative Research Department. But he found to his surprise, he was rather innocent, I think, that the Conservatives weren't interested in India they were interested in matters like housing and education and the economy and so on. But in any case, the Labour Party were in power and they were committed to Indian independence. And Powell remembered spending one evening, I think, in 1947, after the separation of India had become a political fact, walking about the streets all night, trying to digest it. One's whole world had been altered. And he didn't want to accept... Indian independence, and he, by all accounts, sent a memorandum to Churchill objecting to it. And Churchill asked, the say, he rang up the research department to ask, who was that young madman who has been telling me how many divisions I will need to reconquer India? Despite this, uh, Powell became a candidate in a by-election in 1947 in a Labour seat, which he couldn't hope to win. And he was then adopted for Wolverhampton Southwest, uh, despite the chairman of the Constituency Association warning the selection committee before he came in. Now, I just want to say to you, before the next candidate comes in, don't be put off by appearances. He became the candidate for Wolverhampton Southwest, which he represented in Parliament till February 1974. And he entered the Commons in 1950, uh, as a devotee, a sub strong supporter of the free market, he, be he was given junior office by Anthony Eden and Harold Macmillan and became a junior minister at the Treasury. But in 1958, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Peter Thornycroft, resigned because he thought the Conservatives were not sufficiently committed to cutting public expenditure and Powell resigned with him. He was brought back by Harold Macmillan in 1960 as Minister of Health, a position then outside the Cabinet, but he entered the Cabinet in 1962. And he established, it's fair to say, a reputation as a humane minister who was particularly concerned over issues which were not then fashionable. TB patients, long-stay young patients, matters of social welfare in general, he extended visiting hours in hospitals and he introduced new uniforms to staff in mental hospitals. He paid particular um, uh, concern, showed particular concern with mental hospitals and he once said, only the best is good enough for Broadmoor, which wasn't, again, a popular thing to say. But in 1963, he resigned again for the second time or rather refused to serve under Macmillan's successor, Sir Alec Douglas Hume, who was chosen in very controversial circumstances. And it wasn't wholly clear why Powell refused to serve. It's true he'd supported Hume's um, um, competitor, R.A. Butler, but Butler was willing to join the government. But Powell said this was a matter of honour, that he'd said he would not serve under Hume if Hume was chosen, and he had to stick to that, even if others didn't. And Hume uh, called him in to try and get him to change his mind. And Powell replied typically, well, I don't expect, Alec, you expect me to give you a different answer on Saturday from the one I gave you on Friday. I'd have to go home and turn all the mirrors round. So he was in the wilderness again. Now, Hume lost the 1964 election narrowly, 
and resigned the Conservative leadership in 1965. And there was then a contest for the leadership between Edward Heath and Reginald Maudling. But Powell thought he'd put his hat in the ring to test his free market views, a platform for those views. And um, it showed he had very little support at that time because Heath had 150 votes and won. Maudling had 133, but Powell only had 15. Nevertheless, Heath was magnanimous and put Powell in the shadow cabinet as defence spokesman, where he thought perhaps he couldn't do too much harm. But after 1966, Powell began to take up the issue of immigration. And on the 23rd of April, 1968, he made a speech at Birmingham, which I will talk about in some detail, which has a claim to be the most explosive speech ever made in Britain since the war, and which led to him being expelled from the shadow cabinet. But first, I want to put that speech in context of the immigration issue, which was a consequence of the end of empire. Now, by the 1960s, Powell had come to accept, as you had to perhaps, that the empire had ended, that you weren't going to reconquer India. But very characteristically, he said, if the empire has come to an end, it must be finished with completely. You mustn't bother with all the leftovers of empire, like the Commonwealth, free immigration, all these other things. Britain must stand for Britain. Forget about all the historic ties. It was a characteristic, logical shift, if you like. But because of the empire, Britain did not have, at the time Powell spoke, and did not have till 1981, it may seem odd now, but Britain had no definition of British citizenship. That citizenship, until 1948, was imperial. That is, everyone living in the British Empire owed allegiance to the king and therefore could freely move from any country in the empire to another. Of course, in those times, not many people did move. Transport costs were expensive and there was very little travel. Now, um, this um, position was undermined by two developments, fundamental developments, I think, occurring in the late 1940s. The first was the independence of India, which Powell had um, argued against. Because before the independence of India, all the countries which had become independent had been countries of white settlers, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and South Africa. And they looked, at least the white people there looked, to Britain as the mother country. So they were happy to recognize the king as king of Australia, Canada, South Africa, so on. But of course, the Indians, uh, India was not a country of white settlement. It was an indigenous country, if you like, a mother country of its own. And they didn't see the king uh, as a symbol of allegiance, but as a symbol of British domination over India. So the Indians said, when we become independent, we don't want to uh, remain a monarchy. We want to become a republic. But we want to remain in the Commonwealth as a republic. Could it be done? And that was a problem for British policymakers. They, they had two alternatives. The first is they could have said, no, you can't. Uh, the empire involves allegiance to the king. It's, it's going to be a tightly knit empire. If you said that, you'd say the empire would be almost entirely a white empire. But people said, after all, there's no difference in principle between India, or Africa for that matter, and Australia, Canada, because the whole purpose of the empire is to prepare countries for self-government and independence. Canada had been the first in 1867, then Australia and New Zealand. India was the first non-white country. Policymakers in Britain, both Labour and Conservative, the empire is not based on colour, and an independent country is free to choose its own form of government. The Indians choose to have a republic. We therefore want India to remain in the Commonwealth. This means we have to find a new formula. So the test is no longer allegiance to the king, but the test is the king, and now the queen, should be recognised as head of the Commonwealth a symbolic title with no powers. I say that um, 
advisedly, there's a letter in the Times today which is mistaken about this Commonwealth Charter saying that the Queen is acting on advice in signing it. She's not. It's a purely symbolic position with no powers of any kind attached to it. It's like the position of Supreme Governor of the Church of England. It's not accountable to anyone. It's a pure symbolic position uh, that holds the Commonwealth together. And it's the basis for the multiracial empire. And the Asian and African members have uh, entirely followed the Indian lead. They don't want to be monarchies. They are all republics. It's interesting, the Queen's, it's, it's, it's often forgotten, the Queen's Christmas and Commonwealth Day broadcasts are not made as Queen of Britain or Queen of anywhere else, but as head of the Commonwealth, and therefore not made on the advice of ministers. British ministers have no constitutional role to advise her as head of the Commonwealth. Now, this meant a less tightly knit Commonwealth, but a multiracial Commonwealth and a much larger one, which now covers one third of the world, and in it, in that Commonwealth, non-whites outnumber whites by six to one. And this was a decision made by the Labour government post-war, but strongly supported by the Conservative opposition. It wasn't a matter of party opposition, but Powell didn't support it. He said this was a sham. He said it substitutes symbolism for real allegiance. So that's the first change that occurred in the 40s. The second change was the Canadians said, we want our own local definition of citizenship, of what it means to be a Canadian citizen, and other member states of the Commonwealth would follow. So we had to make some decision as to what to do. And we did in the British Nationality Act of 1948, which Powell again was opposed to. And what we said was this, that citizens of the various self-governing Commonwealth countries, like Canada and Australia, and citizens of the United Kingdom and the non-self-governing colonies were all Commonwealth citizens with free right of entry into Britain. Again, that was before mass migration was thought about. Now, some people say that altered the position, but it didn't. It just rationalised the previous position of the empire or Commonwealth being a single unit. But in theory, it meant that 800 million people could have the right to settle in Britain. Now, at the time, it's fair to say, most policymakers were thinking about Australia and Canada. And they'd been thinking about the war and our kith and kin and all that. And they were saying, you can't stop Australians and Canadians coming to Britain. They probably didn't believe that many people from the West Indies or India would come to Britain with very high transport costs. And it wasn't clear that Britain would have full employment for a long period, that there'd be jobs and so on. But I hasten to add this, that even if they'd thought that, they would have made the same decision. The reason being that they could only distinguish between Australia, Canada on the one hand and India, the West Indies on the other by putting a colour bar in the statute. And no British politician was prepared to do that. Said it went against the whole idea of empire to discriminate on grounds of colour. So they did not take that decision. And they did not take the decision only British people are British citizens, because that meant denying entry to Australians and Canadians and so on. Now, the Labour government put forward that act, but it was, again, supported strongly by Conservatives. Now, many would argue, and this was Powell's argument, this was backward-looking legislation. It assumed a cohesive empire which was disappearing, that Britain was the mother country which had to set an example. And the motto that people used was Civis Britannicus Sum, like Civis Romanus Sum, that just as any Roman citizen, citizen of the empire, was a citizen of Rome, so anyone in the Commonwealth was a citizen of Britain, whatever the colour, all had the same status and allegiance. And the paradox later on, because most of those who favoured unlimited immigration were on the left in politics and bitter critics of empire, but the free entry policy derived its justification from empire, so it should have been the wrong way around. The Conservatives should have supported the imperialist party, and the left should oppose it, but it, as things worked the other way around. Now, um, we didn't begin to restrict uh, immigration from the Commonwealth until 1962, but by that time, almost all the primary immigration from the Commonwealth had already occurred. Um, now, governments in the 1950s thought about restricting immigration, but didn't do so, and they've been accused of weakness for not doing so. These were conservative governments. 
But that's unfair. They weren't weak. They thought it would be wrong in principle. And um, if you take um, the Conservative Home Secretary in the 1950s, Sir David Maxwell Fife, who was not generally thought to be a liberal-minded person, he said this in a cabinet memorandum, even to contemplate restricting immigration from the colonies would be a step forward towards breaking up the empire, and in other quarters it would be regarded as evidence that the government are in favour of a colour bar. The colonial secretary, Alan Lennox Boyd, who again is not generally thought of as a liberal, said he would only accept control if it was applied to the old Commonwealth as well as the new. He said, to me, it would be a tragedy to bring to an end the traditional right of unrestricted entry into the mother country of Her Majesty's subjects, and quite unthinkable to do so on grounds of colour. He said that in 1958, and he threatened to resign if governments persisted with that, which they didn't. So it was a matter of principle they weren't going to do it. Now, you may think they were right, you may think they were wrong, but the main primary immigration to Britain came between 1948 and 1962, and by the time that government started to restrict immigration, it was too late, if you, if you wanted to restrict it. Now, in the 1950s, there were about half a million primary, so-called primary migrants into Britain from the old Commonwealth. Uh, as a matter of comparison, from 2004, there were one and a half people from Poland and other central, one and a half million people from Poland and other central European countries who came to Britain, a half of whom, about three quarters of millions, are staying permanently. So it's many more than the Commonwealth immigrants from the 50s. Now, with family reunification, the number of half a million would at least double after 1962, but there was now no way of preventing the growth of immigration because you couldn't stop dependents coming in. It'd be inhumane to do so, to stop spouses and children and parents and the like coming in. You could only, you could only alter it by forcible repatriation, which not even Enoch Powell ever suggested. But after 1962, with two important exceptions which I shall discuss, primary immigration came almost completely to an end. In 1962, the, an act was passed limiting immigration, but Britain was already in the process of being transformed from a homogenous nation at the head of a multiracial empire to a multicultural country with no empire. It's a great change, and critics of the policy, it was too late, but critics of the policy said we were never asked, we were never consulted about that. Now, the 19, in 1962, the Conservative government of Harold Macmillan now distinguished between citizens who were allowed to enter the country and citizens who weren't. And the administration of it is quite complex, and I won't go into it, it's probably too complex already, but broadly speaking, uh, people from the new Commonwealth lost their right of unrestricted entry. They had to uh, get an employment voucher, a work voucher to enter, and the numbers were strictly regulated. But there were still no controls over dependence, so the main immigration was dependence, and primary immigration was over. Dependence still had an unconditional right of entry. But the issue was becoming politically explosive in parts of the West Midlands, and I think this is what influenced Powell. That in the 1964 general election, the Labour Party won the election with a 3.5% swing. But in one seat in Smethwick, where there was a large immigrant population, there was a 7.2% swing to the Conservatives. And the seat was lost by Labour to a Conservative alderman called Peter Griffiths, who it was said, uh, I think rightly, ran a racialist campaign. And that was very much noticed because the person whom Griffiths defeated was the Labour Foreign Secretary, or proposed Foreign Secretary, Patrick Gordon Walker. So it was a very um, uh, high-profile constituency. And there were two other constituencies, another in Birmingham and Slough, Eton and Slough, where the Conservatives won the seat from Labour against the national swing. Now, when Alderman Griffiths um, uh, won this seat, Harold Wilson, the Labour Prime Minister, sent a telegram to Gordon Walker and said, the whole country knows why you lost and all honour to you. And when uh, Peter Griffiths um, took his seat in Parliament, um, Wilson said this constituted a lasting brand of shame on the Conservative Party and Griffiths would be a parliamentary leper. <laughs> 
in the House of Commons. And one of Wilson's allies, Richard Crossman, wrote in his diaries, ever since the Smethwick election, it has been quite clear that immigration can be the greatest potential vote loser for the Labour Party if we are seen to be permitting a flood of immigrants to come in and blight the central areas in all our cities. Now, many Conservatives were unaware of this. They represented rural constituencies, but Powell, in a constituency in the West Midlands, would have been aware of it and would have noticed what was happening. Now, the Labour Party in 1962 had opposed the Commonwealth Immigration Act and argued for free entry. But in 1965, they actually tightened the working of the Act with a white paper which reduced the numbers of work vouchers available for Commonwealth immigrants, a much more stringent application of legislation. And again, Crossman wrote in his diary, politically, fear of immigration is the most powerful undertow today. We felt we had to out-trump the Tories by doing what they would have done, and so transforming our policy into a bipartisan policy transforming their policy, sorry, into a bipartisan policy. And both parties accepted the argument, which I think is accepted now as a consensus, that if you want to create good race relations in Britain, you have to have restrictions on immigration so that it's of manageable proportions. And they said the argument for immigration restrictions is not racist, that integration is possible if people do not feel that it's unlimited and never-ending. Now, some people on the left disagreed with that and said, we still want free entry. And some people on the right, of whom Powell was the leader, said that didn't go far enough. Now, as ill luck would have it, another crisis arose, an unexpected crisis, which in was going to increase the number of primary immigrants into Britain because of the position of the Kenyan Asians. Now, when Kenya had become independent uh, in 1963... Uh, the Asians in Kenya were given the option of retaining their uh, traditional Commonwealth citizenship or becoming Kenyan citizens. Now, um, there were 200,000 uh, Kenyan Asians, of whom only 20,000 applied for Kenyan citizenship. The reason being that they feared, I think rightly feared, discrimination by the Kenyan authorities. And many of those who applied for Kenyan citizenship didn't get it because of bureaucratic delays and so on. Now, the discrimination against Asians in Kenya intensified uh, with independence and many uh, sought to leave the country. And uh, there were about 200,000 who had passports issued by the British government uh, which gave them the right of entry. Now, the Labour government, uh, some would say panicked, but anyway, they acted very rapidly. They pushed through a Commonwealth immigration bill restricting the right of holders of British passports in Kenya to enter the country. And this went through in just a few days. It was pushed through in a great hurry. Now, some Conservatives voted against it, including Ian MacLeod, who I spoke of in my second lecture, and also a very young MP who became quite distinguished later on, Michael Heseltine. And some Labour people voted against it as well, uh, Michael Foote and Shirley Williams, because the effect of this legislation was to leave those Kenyan Asians in effect stateless, with no rights. But polls showed the vast majority in the country were in favour of this legislation. And again, Crossman, voted, uh, Crossman wrote in his diary, he said, a few years ago, everyone here would have regarded the denial of entry to British nationals with British passports as the most appalling violation of our deepest principles. Now they are quite happily reading aloud their departmental briefs in favour of doing just that. Now, in the shadow cabinet, the Conservatives under Edward Heath's leadership were very unhappy about supporting this legislation. And two members of the shadow cabinet said they would only support it if the Conserv Conservatives did not oppose the race relations bill which Roy Jenkins was pursuing through Parliament, producing through Parliament. And what Roy Jenkins was doing as a kind of counterpart to limiting the rights of the Kenyan Asians was to have a Race Relations Act extending the prohibition against discrimination to employment and housing. There was already an act about public places, pubs, restaurants and theatres. This extended it to employment and housing. Now, some Conservatives, again Ian MacLeod and Michael Heseltine, voted for the Race Relations legislation. Mm -hmm. 
But the Conservative shadow cabinet, of which Enoch Powell was a member, decided not to support it, but not to oppose it either, but to produce a reasoned amendment opposing certain elements in the race relations legislation, particularly the elements involving race relations courts, rights to damages, and they said you must make a distinction between a company systematically discriminating and a private individual. And they said if you don't, it will exacerbate racial feeling. And they said that was important. But they said we must be very clear of the fact we're not supporting this bill, we must give no countenance to any suggestion that we're supporting racialist policies, and therefore we must be very sensitive in what we say about it, so that we are not misled. And this is the context of the Birmingham speech of Enoch Powell on the 20th of April. And he began in this way, you may say this is a strange way of showing sensitivity to um, uh, racial um, uh, problems. He said, a week or two ago, I fell into conversation with a constituent, a middle-aged, quite ordinary working man employed in one of our nationalised industries. After a sentence or two about the weather, he suddenly said, if I had the money to go, I wouldn't stay in this country. I made some deprecatory reply to the effect that even this government couldn't last forever. But he took no notice and continued, I have three children, all of them been through grammar school, two of them married now with family. I shan't be satisfied till I've seen them all settled overseas. In this country, in 15 or 20 years' time, the black man will have the whip hand over the white man. And he then said, what he is saying, thousands and hundreds of thousands are saying and thinking. Not throughout Great Britain, perhaps, but in the areas that are already undergoing the total transformation to which there is no parallel in a thousand years of English history. And he then said, those whom the gods wish to destroy, they first make mad. We must be mad, literally mad as a nation, to be permitting the annual inflow of some 50,000 dependents, who are for the most part the material of the future growth of the immigrant descended population. It is like watching a nation busily engaged in heaping up its own funeral pyre. He then spoke of the race relations legislation, which he said was risking throwing a match onto gunpowder because it was elevating the immigrant and his descendant into a privileged or special class. And he said it was establishing a one-way privilege by Act of Parliament. And he, near the end of his speech, he concluded with a passage that's become most famous. He said, as I look ahead, I am filled with foreboding. Like the Roman, I seem to see the river Tiber foaming with much blood. The speech is sometimes called the rivers of blood speech. He didn't use that phrase. He used a phrase which came from Virgil, but I don't think any of his audience knew that. Um, uh, the quotation, the river Tiber foaming with much blood. And if it were being charitable, you might say that was metaphorical and he shouldn't have uh, used that particular phrase. But still, there was enough in that speech to um, cause trouble. Now, um, there are already serious differences of opinion on the actual policies between Powell and the rest of the Shadow Cabinet. There was first that he said it was really very difficult, if not impossible, for Commonwealth immigrants to integrate. Secondly, you shouldn't enforce equal rights for non-white people. Thirdly, you should ban dependence, which was not the policy of the um, uh, Conservative Shadow Cabinet. And therefore, you should oppose the race relations bill in principle. Um, it was absurd to say, in my opinion, it, it was a one-way privilege because it could be invoked by whites as well as non-whites. And uh, uh, Powell said that he'd seen notices for employment saying Jamaicans only. Well, that was just as illegal under the Act saying no coloureds. But, of course, it would be invoked more by non-whites since they were more likely to be discriminated against. And that, on, oddly enough, went against public opinion because although most people favoured strong immigration control, they also favoured the legislation against discrimination. But the most important point, I think, of the speech was not the precise differences of opinion, but the inflammatory language, which particularly annoyed the Shadow Cabinet, uh, having said that the issue must be treated very sensitively. Sensitively. 
And there were various anecdotes, which I won't repeat, rather unpleasant anecdotes, about bad behaviour by Caribbean landlords. But uh, studies previously had shown that um, bad, bad, uh, there, was, there was no exceptionally high instance of abuses in property for which coloured landlords are responsible. And that there was widespread discrimination against non-whites. Um, one organisation sent out a British person, a Hungarian person, a West Indian, uh, to answer job applications and um, uh, uh, advertisements for, for rented accommodation and found widespread discrimination and found that the worst of it was that often the immigrant wasn't aware that he or she was being discriminated against, uh, that there was very widespread discrimination. And uh, Heath uh, said that he thought the speech was racialist in tone and liable to exacerbate racial tensions and he rang up Enoch Powell to say that he was dismissed from the shadow cabinet. And those were the last words the two of them ever exchanged. Uh, public opinion showed, again, oddity, that 69% disapproved of the dismissal. Perhaps they thought it was unfair he hadn't been given a hearing or something. I don't know, but anyway. Um, he said, uh, he, um, uh, said at the time that he disputed that he was a racialist, he was asked, is it true you don't like coloured people, Mr. Powell? He said, I have very little background of the West Indies and West Indians. He said, that's regrettable, you talk so much about them. He said, well, I can't help it, but I have considerable background knowledge of the peoples of India and Pakistan, who form three-fifths of all the immigrants. I fell in love with India when I went there, and I have no sense of superiority because of a white skin, either to an Indian or a West Indian. Now, this was a time when both party leaders were very unpopular. Wilson uh, in the Labour government, because the economy wasn't doing well, and Heath, the Conservative opposition leader, because he didn't seem to be able to communicate to the public. And Powell became immediately a kind of a folk hero. There were marches of Smithfield porters and dockers in his favour. And um, yeah, there, there was clearly a very strong element, Presumably, people didn't regularly vote Conservative, a working-class element, supporting him. And then in uh, Eastbourne in November, he made an even more inflammatory speech, saying integration was not possible without mass repatriation, and that if you didn't have mass repatriation, which said should be voluntary, uh, that civil war was likely. And you'll get an idea of the flavour from the first uh, video of Powell, which if the IT people can put it on, of a meeting, a rather raucous meeting. All right, and he's going, there you are, you see, there's the BBC, there's the television, there's television, that's what television is for in this country, television in this country is used to cast the mantle over disorder. When I referred two years and more ago to whole areas, towns and parts of towns across England being occupied by different sections of the immigrant and immigrant descended population, the prediction was derided and denounced. The facts which have since become known have proved it true. I have demonstrated that even after making every concession, however improbable, however unreal, a fifth or a quarter of such towns and cities as Wolverhampton, Birmingham and inner London will in course of time consist of the Commonwealth immigrants and their descendants. There has been no attempt at refutation. No refutation is now possible. I declare that in my judgment, based upon what knowledge I have of human nature and upon what observation I have made of events in the world, the prospective growth in this country of the, comic, of the Commonwealth immigrant and immigrant descended population will result in civil strife of appalling dimensions and that institutions and laws, let alone exhortations,
will be powerless to prevent it. Well, I think that gives you an idea, a flavour of um, Powell. Now, uh, in 1970, the Conservatives won the general election and Edward Heath became Prime Minister. Ironically, there are indications that Heath owed his success to Powell, who'd associated in voters' minds the idea that the Conservatives were more hostile to immigration than the Labour Party. And uh, that seemed to end, ironically, it seemed to end Powell's chances of the Conservative leadership, because there was now a government which um, believed in the free market, as Powell did, and it was going to adopt a very stringent policy on immigration. And indeed, the Heath government, in 1971, passed legislation which, in effect, equated Commonwealth citizens with aliens, with, for with foreigners in general, and had a definition of those who were entitled to free entry called a patrial, which was someone with a parent or grandparent born in Britain. And you may say that's an implicit colour bar, and there was to be no further large-scale immigration. Now, then uh, things began to go into Powell's direction again. Um, firstly, because the Heath government entered Europe, and I'll talk of that in a few moments. Secondly, because Heath abandoned in 1972 his free market policy for a policy of intervention in industry and a statutory incomes policy, which Powell was strongly opposed to. But thirdly, because of what happened in Uganda, which was even worse than what happened in Kenya, because in Uganda, the African dictator, President Amin, expelled 73,000 Ugandan Asians from the country. It gave them three months to leave in, in 1972. And there were 73,000 Asians in Uganda, and um, around half of them had British passports. Now, the Heath government, um, in contrast to the previous Labour government, accepted uh, these uh, people coming in, said it was the last large-scale primary immigration that we had. But again, Powell was opposed to that. Now, um, the um, only non-European Union immigration we now have are dependents, asylum seekers, and those very few who can get work permits, which are rigidly rationed. So we have a strict problem, but... You'll notice I said non-European Union because the problem now presents itself in a new form with the European Union because the free movement of peoples is a basis of the Treaty of Rome, signed in 1957. Again, it was signed when there were just six countries uh, in the European community, France, Germany, and Benelux countries in Italy. No one thought the ex-communist countries, which were at a lower level of economic development, would be part of Europe. But nevertheless, it now follows that people, anyone from 27, 26 other countries, 27 from the summer when Croatia joins, have free entry into the United Kingdom and other countries. So that's like the situation with Commonwealth immigration before 1962, with this difference that before 1962, we could alter the position by statute. We can't alter the Treaty of Rome by statute unless 27 other countries agree there has to be uh, an amendment to the Treaty of Rome which requires unanimous agreement. I'll give you some idea of the figures of immigration which may interest you. From 1881 to 1914, around 325,000 Jews came into Britain from Eastern Europe. From 1933 to 1939, about 50,000 Jews from Germany and countries around Germany. In 1948 to 62, 250,000 people from the Caribbean. 1972, 30,000 expelled Ugandan Asians. 2004, one and a half million East Europeans, of whom around three quarters of a million remain, and then free immigration from Romania and Bulgaria. So immigration is again a key issue. It takes a different aspect. It's nothing to do with colour, but it takes a different aspect with the European Union. And all studies show that one of the main reasons why people who oppose the European Union is the immigration issue. So this takes me on to the second uh, of Powell's great issues, which is Europe. And Powell was opposed to our entry into the European community, as it then was, 
precisely because he said it involves restrictions on British sovereignty. And, of course, one key restriction is the ability to decide upon your own immigration policy. That's one restriction of sovereignty. The Italians and Greeks are now finding other restrictions on sovereignty. And Powell said, because of our own long history, uninterrupted history, Parliament plays a crucial role in Britain, which it doesn't in any of the other continental countries. And that we define ourselves not as Europeans, but as partly in Europe, but partly out. And he said our folk memories of 1940, and going even further back to the Napoleonic Wars, are when we stood alone against the continent, not as being part of Europe. And he said the main reason for that is that unlike the continental countries, we couldn't be defeated in a land war because of the English Channel. And he said our similarity is not with the continental countries, but with another half-in, half-out country, which is Russia, who couldn't be defeated because of her immensity, immense size, and therefore it's natural that Britain and Russia should have a common interest, which we don't have with the continent. And therefore, we can never totally commit ourselves to the continent the way that, for example, the French, the Germans, and other people could do. And that because of our long history of institutional uh, continuity, we are more aware of what the sacrifice of sovereignty means than continental countries are. And he said, if you look at the original six, four of them only came into existence within the last two centuries. And of course, he would now say the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, many of them only came into existence in 1918, whereas we, of course, have a much longer history and our historical experience is so profoundly different from that of our continental neighbours. And this, he says, was widened after the war because the continental six, which formed the community, had all been either fascist countries or occupied by fascist countries and had to start again with new constitutions. And because they started with new constitutions, they were quite happy about building new institutions, which we didn't like to do. We were evolutionary and relied on adapting the institutions of the past, House of Lords, House of Commons, the monarchy and so on, rather than creating new ones, and therefore Europe wasn't really appropriate for us. Now, in making this argument, he faced Edward Heath, who was the most pro-European Prime Minister we've had since the war, arguably the only genuinely European Prime Minister, and he'd become Prime Minister in 1970. Now, in his campaign, um, Enoch Powell said, in a speech in June 1973, which was prescient as regards his future, the principle of self-government was more important than party allegiance. And in an interview afterwards, he said he'd be prepared to face Labour rule, the rule of the Labour Party, for the rest of his life if that preserved the sovereignty of Parliament. Now, Powell had voted with the Labour Party against entry into Europe. The Labour Party's policy in opposition then was rather similar to David Cameron's now. The Labour Party said, we want to renegotiate to secure better terms for Britain and then we will put the issue to the British people in a referendum. And Powell said that gave people the one chance to leave Europe. Now in February 1974, Heath called an election, not on the issue of Europe, but an issue arising from his statutory incomes policy and the clash with the miners which that led to, because the miners were breaking the policy and going on strike to try and breach it. And Heath's policy was, who governs, the miners or us? Powell said that was a bogus issue, because as a result of the oil crisis, the government would have to pay the miners extra, whoever won the election. The, with the rise in the price of oil, we needed the coal, and therefore we had to pay the miners more. He said, I consider it an act of gross irresponsibility that this general election has been called in the face of the current and impending situation. The, the election will in any case be fraudulent, for the object of those who called it is to secure the electorate's approval for a position which the government itself knows to be untenable in order to make it easier to abandon that position subsequently. It, has, it is unworthy of British politics and government to try to steal success 
by telling the public one thing during an election and doing the opposite afterwards. He never explicitly said, vote Labour. He spoke during the election campaign for the so-called Keep Out movement, Keeping Britain Out, and three days before the election, he said a vote for Labour is the only way to ensure that Britain stays out of Europe. And he said in that speech, here is a man who promised his electors in 1970 that he would do everything in his power to prevent British membership, who voted against it in every division, major or minor, which took place in the ensuing parliament, who did so even when success would have precipitated a dissolution, who allied himself openly on the subject with his political opponents, who made no secret of his belief that its importance overrode that of all others, and who warned that was one of the issues on which men will put country before party. So he said he would not stand as a conservative. He said you can't stand as an individual under the British system. The parliamentary system depends on party. He had to support a party. He said there was only one way that people could get rid of Edward Heath and uh, keep out of Europe. And the day before the election, he said he'd voted by post for the Labour candidate in his old constituency of Wolverhampton South West. And a meeting just before the election, you can see what happened if the IT people have that. For one man, however, there was no doubt about the truth behind this election. Mr. E. Powell described it as a fraud and withdrew. The retirement was brief, and with only a few days to go before polling, Mr. Powell re-emerged into the spotlight to urge his supporters to vote Labour, a remark which prompted one of them to call him a Judas. Judas was paid. Judas was paid. I am making a sacrifice. A brief look at the shortest election campaign since the war. Now, in the February 1974 election, the Labour Party won a narrow victory. There was a hung parliament. Labour had four seats more than the Conservatives and formed a minority government and Edward Heath never held office again. Now, in such a narrow election, you can say a host of factors could have been important, but I don't think anyone could doubt that Powell's intervention made a difference. And the swing against the Conservatives in the West Midlands, which was Powell there, was larger than elsewhere. Um, and I th in my opinion, there's no doubt that Powell made an, an important difference. There had to be another election with a, a minority government which was unstable in October 1974. And in that election, Powell stood again for Parliament, but not as a Conservative, but as an Ulster Unionist for the Ulster constituency of South Down, where, which is seat he held until 1987. And he then took up his, the final cause which I will be discussing, his hostility to devolution. He said Northern Ireland should ha not have devolved institutions, it should be integrated into the rest of the United Kingdom and governed just like London or Cornwall or any other part of the United Kingdom to show the uh, nationalist population that they couldn't detach Ulster from the United Kingdom either by force or any other way. And he was also opposed to Scottish devolution. He said asymmetrical devolution was not possible. It raised the famous West Lothian question of which he is the real originator that you cannot have Scottish MPs voting for English laws when English MPs don't vote for Scottish laws. And he was the main uh, opponent of the devolution legislation in the 1970s, though Tam Diel is often thought of as the hero of the defeat. And he said the strains would inevitably lead to separation. Now, uh, Enoch Powell lost his seat in South Down in 1987 because the nationalist vote, which had hitherto been split, united round one candidate. And he lived on until 1998. Uh, when he was buried, he was buried in the uniform of a brigadier of his regiment. Shortly before he died, in 1997, the Blair government won the election, and Powell's comment was, they have voted to break up the United Kingdom, because he thought the Blair's government's policies on devolution would have that effect. Now let me conclude briefly, I'm sorry this has been such a long lecture, we're talking about his legacy. 
You can say on the one hand, he was a very, very clever man, perhaps one of the cleverest who's been in British politics since the war, who achieved very little in legislative or any other terms. He was not a team player. Some people sometimes say he was a great parliamentarian, but none of his important speeches in after 1964 were made in Parliament. They were made in the country where he couldn't be criticised and you couldn't debate with him. And he was much less popular in Parliament than in the country. His colleagues either disliked or distrusted him. And they uh, had, had no confidence in him. He didn't try, as a Norrin Bevan had done and Tony Benn was to do and Jenkins was to do, to build up a faction supporting him. Uh, it would have been difficult to do because on some issues he was surprisingly liberal. For example, he was opposed to capital punishment and he supported homosexual law reform, which perhaps one wouldn't think of. But his strength lay in the country, not in Parliament. Uh, but it's a very difficult thing in our system to impose, as it were, populist strength in the country, in Parliament. And the very actions that made him a celebrity in the country made him distrusted by his parliamentary colleagues. But uh, I suspect that he altered public opinion. He could fill a hall. He said politicians don't alter public opinion but articulate and express it. And uh, he arguably mobilised supporters in two general elections in opposite directions, 1970 for the Conservatives, 1974 for Labour. Uh, a remarkable feat. On the free market, he was a precursor of Margaret Thatcher's views. More generally, he channeled the alienation and disillusionment of the 1960s, which people, some people thought would lead to a swing to the left, the student revolt, the permissive society and all that, but its real consequences were a swing to the right, to Margaret Thatcher and Keith Joseph and the reaction against the 1960s. On immigration, you may say that he legitimised hostility to non-white people. Certainly his predictions of ethnic conflict have not come true, and despite various blemishes, I think it can reasonably be said that ethnic relations in Britain are a success story, and they were, on the whole, a peaceful and tolerant multicultural society. You may say that's partly due to restrictions on immigration, but these owe little to Powell, and the multicultural society was begun before he started his speeches on the subject. Now, as I say, immigration is now a key problem in a different way in regard to Romania and Bulgaria, in a way which Powell would have understood as a restriction of sovereignty. But on the European Union and on devolution, the jury are still out. David Cameron's accepted that a renewal of British consent for Europe is needed, that full-hearted consent to the abandonment of sovereignty has not been given. Devolution, it could lead to Scottish independence, we don't know. At the moment, the odds are not, the odds are against it. But what unites all Powell's thinking is the logical consequences of the end of empire and the return to a sense of Britishness. He is the prime representative in post-war politics of British nationalism, or perhaps better to say, English nationalism. And English nationalism defines itself partly in opposition to Scottish devolution, but more importantly with Euroscepticism. And Powell once said, nationhood, with all that word implies, is what the Tory party is ultimately about, and he saw it as an absolute. So the consequence of the end of empire should be to return to Britishness or to Englishness, which is represented itself in Parliament, in a sovereign Parliament. Do not diminish that sovereign Parliament by subordinating Westminster to the European Union or by creating competing parliaments in Scotland and Wales, which is a symbol that Westminster can no longer represent the interests of people in Scotland and Wales. So for him, that represented the watershed, the parting of the ways, the saying that a separate nation has been admitted to be there in Scotland and Wales. Above all, Powell expressed a huge gap which perhaps did exist between the political class and the people. In a poll in the Financial Times on the 18th of February this, a couple of weeks ago, 50% uh, said they want to leave the European Union, 37% said they want to remain in. But people who take that view of leaving may say they are not properly represented in Parliament, which is why UKIP gained support. People who were opposed to immigration said their views weren't properly represented in Parliament, uh, 
People who favour an English pardon or English nationalism or say the Scots and Welsh are getting away too much, they say they're not properly representing Parliament. On all these issues, the elite, some say, were agreed. There was a consensus we should enter European Union. There was a consensus on prime immigration, a broad consensus on Scottish devolution, but the people were opposed to it. Now, Powell articulated that opposition and was kept out by the elite consensus and the parliamentary system. Now, was that a good thing or a bad thing? I leave that for you to decide. Thank you. <laughs>